Although Simon had not yet met Sam Stevrenidis, he respected his opinion already. Registration really was a mess. Standing in various w sta standing in various waiting areas and lines for over an hour and a half, Simon signed himself up for a semester that looked more like a life's work. He had a double period with Karada in addition to art history and design and composition, not to mention summary courses in math, English, and biology. The whole process took him doubly long since all his information had been inexplicably filed under Irving Simon. Though Nassau Arts was a selective school, its attendance area included Long Island itself, New York City, and Westchester County, and its students numbered over 1,500. Each was provided with a Nassau Arts orientation packet, which contained a school map, brochures and course lists, commuter information, and other important papers, including a booklet of money-saving coupons from the nearby DeWitt shopping plaza. Riffling through his packet, Simon pulled out a small printed business card, which read, T.C. Surrett, Educational Agent, Locker 0750, your mouthpiece at Nassau. Simon looked up in perplexity. There, right beside the guidance office, was a large table. Behind it sat an immaculately groomed, dark young man, resplendent in a navy blue three-piece business suit with a tastefully subdued necktie. On the wall behind him hung a sign which read, T.C. Surrett Agency. He was greeting old acquaintances and chatting engagingly with a passing parade. Intrigued, Simon approached the booth. Well, I'm really glad you're, to see you're in business again this year, T.C., a tall, red-headed girl was saying. I think I might have washed out last term without you to bat for me. T.C. smiled. Nice to see you again, Kathy. Call on me anytime. His eyes fell on Simon. Hi, new here? My first day. If, if you don't mind my asking, what is all this about? Oh, this is my educational agency. At NASA Arts, you run into a lot of situations, you know, with grades or teachers or administration. You need good, solid representation. That's where I come in. I know all the staff. I've worked with them all before, and I can plead your case. You can get people higher grades? Simon asked in disbelief. Well, it's usually not as simple as that. There's give and take, but I can always work something out. Simon goggled. Why can't the students speak for themselves? Uh-uh, too risky. At a regular high school, that might be all right, but here you're going to want professional assistance. He noted the incredulous look on Simon's face and smiled tolerantly. I can see you're finding this a little hard to swallow, but in a couple of weeks, you'll see exactly how it works. Let me guess, you're in painting, right? How did you know? Just a little hobby of mine. Karate can be tough, and the academics have a habit of creeping up on you. If you have any problems, just come to see me. Well, I don't think so, but thanks anyway. T.C. smiled knowingly. See you later. Sounded like a promise. Simon's Locker, 1102, was located at the very beginning of a long hall in the music wing. He was stowing his coat, mentally repeating his combination, when a booming voice rang out through the hallway. Hey, Simon, over here! A little way down the hall stood Phil Baldwin, waving and beckoning. He met Simon halfway and led him to the locker adjacent to the washroom. Phil indicated a tall, olive-skinned boy who was stowing books and art supplies in the next locker. Hey, Sotrius, get your head out of there. I want you to meet someone. This is the guy I was telling you about. Sam emerged, his gear satisfactorily placed, and Phil performed the introduction. I just saw the weirdest thing, Simon told him. There's this guy who's like an educational agent or something. So he speaks for you when you get into a jam. Oh yeah, T.C. Surrett, said Sam. Could, school couldn't run without him. Have you ever used his services? He's the only person who can get a word in edgewise with Karada. Let me get this straight, said Phil. Whenever you get in big trouble with grades or something and the staff is getting ready to hose you, you call in this guy and he gets you out of it? Don't make any big plans to set fire to the building, Philip. TC couldn't get you off for that. But he's really good when you need a break. My freshman year, I ended up on geography probation for a term. Any test mark below B and I was out. TC bargained them down to a B-. minus. But when my next test came along, I only got a C+. 
Then TC convinced them to search for a few extra marks on my paper on the grounds that I promised to do a makeup report. Save my neck. Do you have to pay him? asked Simon. In a way. You see, he's from Canada. Somehow or another, we talked him to letting him study here. He's in music, sax. But he doesn't have anywhere to live, and he's usually pretty low on cash. So when he works for you, you have to let him come over and stay at your house. No way, laughed Phil. Oh, it's okay. Parents love him because he's very polite and always well-dressed. Phil looked worried. How long do you have to keep him? <laughs> Anticipating trouble, are you, Philip? Um, you know, if sculpting doesn't pan out, I might need someone to negotiate a transfer. Well, the longest he ever stayed at my house was five days. That was probation, which was a pretty big job, but usually it's only two or three. Simon made a mental note to avoid T.C. Sarret at all costs. Any stay at his house lasting more than five minutes would pinpoint him as the son of Interflux. If a visitor somehow managed to miss the good neighbor front doormat, there were still the Interflux envelopes, stationery, and Interflux time is money telephone notepads. Then there was the fact that only rarely would ten minutes go by in the Irving household without at least one mention of Interflux. As the conversation progressed from Sorette to Karada to general school experiences, one thing became abundantly clear to Simon. Sam Stavrinidis was a great favorite among the female population of Nassau Arts. They were coming up to him in droves to ask him how his summer had been and to gaze adoringly into his handsome face. Even those who didn't know him stared long and hard as they passed by. Sam was very casual with them and was always careful to introduce Simon and Phil, who were received politely and instantly dismissed from sight and mind. Phil took it very well, but Simon was developing a massive inferiority complex. He was almost tempted to yell out, My father is the senior executive vice president of Interflux! Whereupon the girls would forget Sam, swept away with visions of the Italian Riviera, and charge accounts at Bloomingdale's. No. Nothing was worth that. Maybe one day he would achieve the devil-may-care attitude of the flake and could moon British nobility with impunity. But if he did, it would be as the world's greatest painter, not as a business tycoon. So, we'll do this first. Here we go. Simon and Sam both opened their year in Emil Carada's painting workshop. The painter was at his intimidating best, looking like a combination of Rasputin and Larry Bird. You can't, you can't get entertainment like this anywhere else in the world, even for money, Sam whispered, as Karada launched into the first temper tantrum of the year. Simon was rigid with shock. This wild-eyed giant was pacing back and forth in front of the class, tearing at his beard, still howling about last year's Vishnik pride. Bad brushwork! Terrible brushwork! I still see it in my mind! Oh, it's painful! Then suddenly the storm was over and he looked benignly down at the class. This year, I'd like to concentrate on improving our brushwork. Weirdest of all was the fact that Simon was the only one in the class who was even faintly perturbed by Karada. The other students, Sam included, sat in impassive relaxation, their expressions ranging from mild boredom to vague interest and slight amusement as the teacher discussed each student's recent work, occasionally flying off the handle and just as suddenly calming down. Where is your sense of color? He bellowed at Peter Ashley, stamping his size 14 construction boot on the boy's desktop as easily as a normal person might have stepped on a footstool. No apple is this purple! If I saw an apple this color, I would take it to Ripley's, not paint it! I'll try to do better, said Peter casually, right into the teacher's face, not four inches away. That's all I can ask for, said Karada kindly. Let me tell you a story. When I was in Munich, there was an artist whose only claim was that he always did his best. One night, he froze to death in the park because his best wasn't enough to pay his rent. He painted purple apples just like this one! Do the cops know about this guy? Simon whispered nervously. Sam grinned. This is nothing. 
When Nassau Arts first hired Karada, they had to redo this entire room in special acoustic tile because the other teachers were complaining about the noise. Stealing himself to absorb the shocks of Karada's frequent blow-ups, Simon also tried to concentrate on learning something about his fellow classmates. At the top of the talent ladder was junior Laura Dixon, who came in for her share of the ranting as runner-up in last year's Vishnik competition. Also very good were Bob Lawrence and his girlfriend Grace Shernick, who had first met under the barrage of a Karata tirade. Peter Ashley also seemed to be one of the class's stars, Purple Apples notwithstanding. The workshop had 12 students at all, but Karada reserved the spotlight of that opening class for Sam Stavrenidis. Mr. Stavrenidis, I don't know where my mind was last year, but looking through your portfolio, I made an interesting discovery. Every picture you submitted had at least one camel in it. Well, sir, that's because I do a lot of Middle Eastern desert scenes, so the camels fit into the subject matter. What about your view of Central Park, which I, like an idiot, allowed you to submit for Vishnu competition? There was a handsome cab pulling two young lovers. My heart is warm. But since Central Park is not in the Middle Eastern desert, why is that handsome cab being pulled by a camel? I felt it was appropriate, said Sam evenly. Simon braced himself for an explosion that would bring the house down, but none came. Instead, Karada marched silently up to the blackboard, reared back, and pounded his forehead against the board so hard that the slate cracked. Simon waited for him to fall unconscious, but he merely stood there facing away from the group, his head enveloped in a cloud of chalk dust. Don't laugh, whispered Sam. Just hold it in until after class. Simon hadn't intended to laugh. He was thinking more along the lines of running for his life. In fact, the only thing that kept him in his seat was that not one other student seemed to think that anything out of the ordinary had taken place. Karada turned to face them, sm smiling benignly. One last thing. Everyone welcome our new student, Mr. Simon. Sometimes it's difficult to be new, so let's show a little extra understanding and patience. The artist that then asked them each to bring a quick nature sketch tomorrow and dismiss the class. Simon was still shaking as he and Sam headed back to their lockers after the double period. I don't understand how you could just sit there with that... that psychopath! Best art teacher in the world, said Sam with conviction. Sam looked do Simon looked dubious. Best? The man should be locked up! He's dangerous! He's soft as a kitten. His bark is a lot worse than his bite. He broke a chalkboard with his face! He yelled at Peter Ashley so loud, it took the curl out of his hair! And poor Laura Dixon! He insulted her and everyone her height! Karada loves Laura, Sam insisted. Simon stared at him in disbelief. Well, then heaven save me from being loved by Karada! Shiler's Creek was a favorite spot of many of the Nassau art students. It was a peaceful location, about a 15 minutes hike along a small trail through the wooded area to the north of the school. Sam brought Simon there after classes. Simon's head was still spinning from his first day at Nassau Art. With Karada's tantrum still ringing in his ears, he'd been hit with five other classes, three of them academics, all of them hard. He was certainly looking forward to a little peaceful sketching in the quiet of the woods, but this was not to be as Phil also trekked out with them. I'm as good as dead in the sculpture department. Have you seen some of the stuff these guys do? It's fantastic. I couldn't even dream of being that good. I'm in big trouble. You've only been there one day, Sam pointed out. And maybe you'll improve, often Simon. Phil was not consoled. I never improve at things I show potential for. Sam seated himself on a rock, propped up his sketchbook on his knee, and surveyed the area. We've all got our problems, he said abstractedly, making a few experimental marks on the page. Very true, agreed Simon. He could not take his eyes off the tip of the tall interflux smokestack that even here showed above the tops of the trees. 
Hey, come on, guys. At least give me a little sympathy. I haven't been at Nassau Arts eight hours, and already I'm in the soup. Sam shrugged. Get an agent. This is a really nice setting and all that, said Simon, but is it just me, or is there something about this creek that's, you know, wrong? That's just the water, Sam explained. You see, the creek snakes over by the Interflux plant. So? So they dump some kind of funky stuff in it, supplied Phil. It contains detergent, and the creek gets a little foamy. But aren't there environmental laws regulating that kind of stuff, so uh, Iman asked? Oh, yeah, but you can't beat Interflux. They took water samples, and sure enough, the plant was dumping too much funk in the creek. So Interflux convinced the town to reclassify Shiler's Creek officially as a stream because for some reason you're allowed to put more funk in a stream than in a creek. Anyway, it turned out that they were a half part per million below the legal limit for a stream, so they get to keep on dumping and we get a creek with suds. Tell them about our field, said Sam, still sketching. Phil grimaced. It's the Interflux executive parking lot now. Naturally, we didn't have too much say in the matter, and someone's always making a big thing about air pollution, but Interflux usually makes the safety requirements by about a billionth of a smoke particle each time it works out that Interflux holds all the aces. So everybody in town hates Interflux? asked Simon. I wouldn't exactly call it hate, said Sam. Man, half the town works there, Phil added. It's just that the company is so big that it manages to offend practically everybody in some way. Simon didn't have the heart to tell them that the existing plant was a mere anthill in comparison to the monstrosity Interflux had planned, including a massive complex of office suites, a tripling of the plant facilities, and warehouses that Simon figured would surround the Nassau Arts building with chrome and gunmetal. With a sigh, he found an angle that appealed to him and began to sketch. Sam was already well into his work, and Phil was leaning over his shoulder, watching intently. Hey, Sotrius, what's that thing you've got there in the bushes? It looks like, uh, Simon came to attention. Sam, you're not putting a camel in there! Sam grinned. I'm going to camouflage this one so he'll never find it. Why are you looking for trouble, Simon asked. You don't tease a lunatic. He'll break up the whole class. You just don't know, Karada. You'll get the hang of it soon. Dad, do you know anything about Shiler's Creek, Simon asked that night at dinner, largely to attract attention from the fact that he was not eating his vegetarian burrito. Stream, son, that's Shiler's stream. Do you know that the plant is polluting it? Oh, no, said his father. It's government-approved waste disposal, very carefully monitored. It wouldn't be pollution unless, um, say, we were putting the same amount of waste material into a creek. But it is a creek, and it foams. How's everyone enjoying dinner, beamed Mrs. Irving. Very tasty, said her husband, casually signaling to Simon with three fingers. Anyway, you don't have to worry about Shiler's Creek, I mean stream. It won't foam anymore. We're digging it up. We'll be laying the foundations for the new warehousing any time now. What's the big interest? Simon concentrated on dismantling the burrito in such a way that it looked at least partially eaten. Oh, I've been doing some sketching in the woods around there. Well, you better make it fast because those trees are coming out too. We're flattening the whole area at the same time to make it easier and quicker. But, Dad, a lot of kids at school really depend on that green space. It's nice and quiet, attractive, and generally a great place to work and relax. Mr. Irving looked mystified. That land has always belonged to Interflux. We let them use it, but now we need it. Guess where I got this recipe, chimed in Mrs. Irving, oblivious to the conversation. The sun, chorused husband, both son and husband. Fine paper, the son, said Mr. Irving approvingly. As Mr. Irving had promised, the unconquerable will of Interflux soon hit the woods north of the school. The howling sounds of chainsaws in the distance rang through Nassau Arts, 
while in the painting studio, it provided an apocalyptic background for Emil Carada's tantrum upon spotting the camouflaged camel in Sam's nature sketch. In the sculpture wing, it was a mournful wail which symbolized Phil's inner emotional state as he gazed bleakly at the large block of wood that was supposed to turn into his first project. Throughout the school, classes were temporarily halted, either officially or just in the minds of the students, as all said silent goodbyes to Shiler's Creek stream and its environs. In conversation, Interflux took a real beating, and, all he, and though, although he knew he was not responsible, Simon was stricken with guilt. Life went on, though, and Simon was amazed at how even in the first week of school, Nassau Arts was all business. His teachers assigned work wholesale as though the semester was almost over. Simon shared a math class with Phil, and the two immediately arranged to split the homework 50-50 in an effort at time saving. No point in both of us doing it all, Phil reasoned, when we can each do half and copy the other guy's stuff before class. We don't have time for this. We're artists. But Phil's classification as an artist was becoming shakier each day as project number one progressed from a block of wood to a lump of wood. And while it did have human form, it was not quite recognizable as the bust of a person, and certainly not Garibaldi as Phil had declared it to be. Simon was having his problems too. His first English paper came back with a grade of D+, plus, a bare pass. The teacher, Mr. Durham, who insisted that all of his students call him Buzz, which was inexplicable since his given name was Xerxes, commented, I didn't feel that you experienced psychic growth in writing this essay. While Simon was in complete agreement with this, with this assessment, it was somewhat alarming since he didn't anticipate psychic growth in future assignments either. And while one D-plus was nothing to panic about, a whole string of them wouldn't go over too well on the home front. Simon's only break that week was that his biology teacher, Miss Glanfield, was so upset over the destruction of the woods north of the school that she canceled class and took to her bed, calling plague, catastrophe, and ten-ton flame balls down on Interflux. Miss Glanfield considered each and every lowly tadpole her little friend, which Simon felt was a trifle inconsistent with a reputation for her dissecting her little friends once they grew up to be frogs. But he accepted the, uh, the, the spare period as a chance to catch up on other work. On Friday afternoon, Simon and Phil were walking down the hallway after last class discussing Phil's sculpture problems. They came up upon Sam seated in front of his locker, oblivious to the admiring looks from passing female students. He was leafing through a thick paperback entitled The Complete Carada, The Teacher's Autobiography. As Phil opened his locker, a sealed envelope fell out and fluttered to his feet. Oh boy, that's it. I'm out of here, he moaned, ripping the letter open. They couldn't even wait until I finished Garibaldi before giving me the boot. He examined the form letter inside. Nathan Krupman requires your participation in his Nassau Arts video film Omni at first light Saturday morning. Flushing Meadows, Corona Park, Southwest Entrance, Queens. Enclosed, please find your lines. Thank you, Nathan Krupman, director. Who's Nathan Krupman? All activity suddenly halted and everyone within earshot stared at Phil as if he had a cabbage for a head. Dead silence fell. You'll have to excuse my friend, Sam explained to the shocked onlookers. He's new here. He just got his first part in Omni. There was a chorus of congratulations and nods of understanding and the hall went back to normal. Phil dropped his voice to a whisper. Who is Nathan Krapman? He's a senior in film and TV, Sam explained. The top student in the department, probably the whole school. He's been working on this project since day one at Nassau. It's something amazing. He must have upwards of a hundred hours of raw footage shot so far, all on beta cassette. He writes it, directs it, designs the set, supplies the costumes, and the actors and crew are all 100% Nassau art students. Practically everyone's been in at some point. It's an honor. 
Have you ever had a part? Of course, a few times. I've worked on the crew, too. And I've helped out with the set building and painting. What part did he give you, Philip? Phil checked the enclosed script. Agamemnon? What's he filming? The Trojan War? Probably. He jumps around a lot. I was in the 1952 World Series sequence. I also had a bit part in the Russian Revolution, but my biggest part was Noah, which we filmed during a rainy spell last fall. Phil was unimpressed. Just how does this Nathan guy know me? Oh, he probably saw your photo in your confidential file. The staff gives him access to everything. Nobody says no to Nathan. Yeah, well, I think he's about to get his first no. I've got enough troubles. I've got Garibaldi to worry about. I don't have time for Agamemnon. Besides, it's never been my ambition to see the sun rise over Queens. Look, said Sam seriously, you can get straight F's and everything and carve lumps ten times worse than Garibaldi, and with a little help from TC here and there, you can still survive at Nassau Arts. But if you refuse to help with Nathan's movie, you can get A pluses by the truckload and carve the piata, and you'd still be finished at this school. That's how this the way that's the way it is. Sounds pretty weird if you ask me, said Phil sulkily. Sam shrugged. There's always Greenbush High. I'll go, said Phil in disgust. I so hope you don't need the wreck tomorrow, because I certainly don't intend to take the train at 5 o'clock in the morning. You think I'll ever get a part in this movie, asked Simon, who was beginning to feel strangely left out in this conversation, and was certain he could play as good an Agamemnon as the next guy. Oh, sure, si said Sam. I think the whole school was in the War of 1812 last spring. Well... I'd better get going. Give me a ring tomorrow, Phil. You can tell me, me all about your big movie debut. That night, Simon had a dream. He was seated against in an interflux warehouse, laboriously counting great mountains of zipper teeth one at a time. There was no escape from this horrible task, since the zipper teeth were piled so high that he was completely shut in on all sides. Then, suddenly, with the tally up in the 15 millions... He lost his count and had to start again at one. He woke up in a cold sweat, images of Interflux still whirling in his head. He could see the bulldozers flattening the almost denuded area north of the school. He pictured the new expanded installation growing out from the existing plants to surround and suffocate Nassau Arts. He sat up and turned on his reading lamp which made the zipper on his windbreaker th thrown over his desk chair gleam at him mockingly. Awake or asleep, there was really no getting away from zipper teeth. Having spent ten of his sixteen and a third years as the son of Interflux, Simon was not one to dump on big business. But it did seem a shame to rip up a terrific wooded area and a nice creek stream which was just so much appreciated by 1,500 students just to build warehouses for his zipper teeth. Not that he begrudged Interflux and its zipper teeth or anything like that. It's just that there were so many out-of-the-way places that nobody cared about which were just crying out for zipper teeth. The woods, or at least what was left of them, should live. Even more important, Simon Irving should be protected from being absorbed by this giant industrial sponge. Sure, he was in Nassau Arts now, but a week on the inside was enough to, ensure, to assure him that the school was no match for the, for the magnetic pull of Interflux and the iron will of Cyril Irving. He could already tell that his father was taking Nassau Arts lightly, could almost hear him announce, See, I told you he'd outgrow this painting nonsense. It was only a phase. It would take something big to move him. Something like the Vishnik Prize. That was it then. He would have to win the Vishnik Prize.